So we are very happy to have Samia uh, here as, uh, as our poet uh, this month. She tells me that she's been at Reed College three years. Not, I, th I thought it was a little bit shorter time, but time, time flies. She is the author of two books of poetry, Gospel and Where the Apple Falls, and two anthologies, Roll Call, a generational anthology of social and political black literature and art, and Best Black Women's Erotica. His books have brought some people joy, according to them. <laughs> I'm sure, this is from Sabia, but I'm sure that's the case. <laughs> Uh, her poetry is, uh, has appeared recently in Poetry, World Literature, Today, Poet Lore, Michigan Quarterly Review, and uh, several other uh, publications. She's the recipient of two Hopwood Awards from the University of Michigan, uh, as well as awards, grants, and fellowships and residency from the Virginia Center for Creative, Creative Arts, where she was a recent NEA writer in residence. Uh, the Astria Foundation and Cave Canem, among others. Her long poem, Quinography, <coughs> I believe is how it's pronounced, was nominated for a 2013 Pushcart Prize. She has published three chapbook poetry collections, Teasing Crow, Wearing Shorts on the First Day of Spring, and <laughs> American Visa. We'll see if we're coming up to wearing shorts. <laughs> A communications professional found focused on editorial, arts, and social justice movements. She is the founding organizer of Fire and Ink, an advocacy organization and writers festival for uh, LGBT, uh, writers of African descent. And we already know that she teaches creative writing at Reed College. So would you join me in welcoming, having Samia Bashir here. Samia. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Paul Ann. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, it is really wonderful to be here on this surprisingly dry evening. Um, so, I'm going to share with you uh, poems from a new book uh, that I've recently finished called Laws of the Black Body. And this book. Um, it uh, looks at kind of how we interact with each other um, as humans, how we love each other, care for each other, don't care for each other, et cetera, uh, through the lens of quantum black body theory, which um, engages uh, the black body, which is an idealized body, um, most easily understood through the lens of like a black hole or something. Um, so it is perfectly absorptive all the light, all the radiation, heat, whatever you shoot at it, it can take it all in while remaining at a constant temperature, right? Um, and so some of the poems are engaging laws, some are engaging various elements of the black body, the, uh, this idealized form, um, and how we all play into it or, uh, or are asked to sometimes. So, the first black body poem that I'm going to read, I kind of go back rather than moving forward into intergalactic space. I go back. And this is called Paleontology. I step from the airplane. My hair melts dead air. I walk click quickly. Click clunk. Click clunk. Click clunk. Barbara Jordan, bronze and sober, glasses poised. The last me I'll see for three more days and three more days forever. Outside, I slow the click clunk to a three sound crawl. Click, click clunk, and etc. I am a woolly mammoth waiting at the cab stand. I am a woolly mammoth stuffed into a cab. I bear the long silence of my extinction through the rear view. My head on the back seat, horns akimbo, I melt dead air. Blame humans for the loss of large mammals, 
like myself, a new study says. My cabby cousin carts my husk to my diorama. The radio blares, the tide is high. The radio rings out, I'm gonna be your number one. <laughs> Synchronous rotation. We had a beautiful full moon a few days back. Did everybody catch that? Yeah. It was stunning, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> And I love thinking about this synchronous rotation, the moon and the earth kind of doing this dance up there. Um, that always tricks me in my mind and makes my mind tickle. Oh, who am I kidding? You never fall like I do. Never bumble and crawl as if time waits for our raw vulnerabilities, do you? As if Time exists for anything else but to stumble, to fall into what shelter we wave on puckered palms. After Dizzy rolled Bags Jackson and his vibes out of Detroit, Bags wrote his love songs in the minor keys. He said, the minor registers the heart, the magnet of us. Iron filings thrown up the greedy gullet of space before struck a crumble, before one turn humbles the other, slow as hours plucked through catgut blue. Please, the old song goes, send me someone to love. Me? Every day I meet someone to love. Every day I meet some minor love or another. Send harmony. Third law. So we encounter in these poems the laws of thermodynamics. We also occasionally, slightly tongue in cheek, encounter Isaac Asimov's laws of robotics. Each September, we suck coffee down like arsenic. <laughs> Tony vanishes through the annex bowel again. Chain split vowels give me away like television. Each cafe blazes to approximate ash. TVs rush the streets on their own two feet. Air pockets meet hush, meet crush, meet moan. We eat our phones. When I mentioned uh, September 11th to my students, they were like, I was seven. I don't know what you're talking about. And I was living in New York at the time. Except I wasn't in New York at the time because I was reading at this uh, literary festival in Amsterdam. and. Uh, and I was scheduled to fly home on September 12th. And the festival ended on September 10th. And so my friend and I said, we have a free day, let's go play. So we went to play. And that was the only day we separated because my friend um, really wanted to spend to uh, more time at the uh, Anne Frank house. And I just kind of wanted to frolic. And the poem that I just read, which I think I'll, I'll read again, um, because I think it, I like how it lives without the story, and I like how it lives with the story. Um, I've written this poem many, many times over the last decade, and it's never been really right. And I think it feels right now because it needed to not have the story. Each September, we suck coffee down like arsenic. Tony vanishes through the annex bowel again. Chain split vowels give me away like television. Each cafe blazes to approximate ash. T 
TVs rush the streets on their own two feet. Air pockets meet hush, meet crush, meet moan. We eat our phones. Perform since you must perform. I was asked tonight, I'm asked almost every day, how do you like teaching to read? And my answer is, I love it. Um, and it's true. And one of the reasons is because I have the most wonderful conversations every day. Um, and this poem that I'm about to hear, which the great and powerful and lovely Lisa Steinman so graciously published in her beautiful journal, Hubbub, um, I think was one of the first poems that I really wrote in Portland. And it started with a wonderful conversation that I had with a colleague. The old carriage house looks older and it's people. Oh, I might say this too. This is such a Portland poem to me and it's very almost spring, this poem too. The old carriage house looks older and it's people. Dogwoods scream across night weary sight. A widow drives her joystick chair through early equinox light and quiet Burlington. Blind, arthritic in a full slip, she insists her bra be worn the way she's always worn her bra. Her pleats lay the way she lays her pleats. Knuckled knots steer her toward another vinyl back, slick already from her sleeping footprints. Her daughter, who year after year saves satiricon for the term's cold gray end, whispers, imagine. Whispers, imagine. Her helping someone else with a ride. Petronius's impotent warrior, taking direction again from the minor gods. <clears throat> Relation between planet and star. And the little girl who caught three small fish with the rod her grandpa made her. She carried goose feathers in her hand, which she'd found in the grass, and she let her grandma hold the reel while she ran one way, then back, and when she showed me her prize, we decided her feathers were too big to carry a duck through the sky. And the fish flopped on our dock once caught. Once her grandma unhooked them and threw them to the wooden planks, then one, then another, then another, they flipped and jumped and gasped. And the little girl wheeled and wheeled. Called her papa back to see what she'd done. Look, I caught them all. Called her grandma back quick with a catch bag and wheeled and wheeled and jumped like a linefish and jumped like a dockfish. Look, Bakan, grandma jumping. Look. I'm at that age where I, I, I never can tell whether the glasses are helping or not. <laughs> <laughs> Consequences of the laws of thermodynamics. Let's try it. When Albert Murray said, the second law adds up to the blues, that in other words, ain't nothing, nothing, he meant it. Not quite the way my pop says, nomads don't show emotions. But more how my grandmother warned that men like women with soft hands, blood red nails, like how Mingus meant truth if you had time for it, facts if you got no time, that years pass zero, one, two, three, and the man you used to flirt with, you can no longer flirt with, thank goodness. <laughs> He's now a man you can't wear your jaw out on about weather, news, or work. A perfect strawberry. 
buried beneath a pack. So the delightful Paul Ann introduced me to a wonderful Portland artist named Tracy Slap, with whom I have made the most wonderful collaborative relationship. And she is a printer. And uh, we've worked together on a, a long poem of mine, the one that uh, Tom mentioned, Chornography. Um, uh, the, that poem engages the legend of John Henry, you know, the steel driving man. And, uh, and Tracy has this project she's was, been working on all year um, called the John Henry Tweets. Um, and if you, you know Twitter, it's this kind of 140 character zip, zip, zip. And her John Henry Treats project um, takes on this idea of labor and work and is tweeting, um, but with a letterpress machine. So she's taking this idea, but instead making it really with her body and with this kind of uh, 19th century technology. Um, and at the Central Library downtown right now, um, on the third floor in the Collins Gallery. You can see there's an exhibit with um, some of the work that we've collaborated on, including the choreography poem um, and a lot of the prints. And, uh, and we worked on the choreography piece. Um, we've done a few things around town with that. Um, but also some of these poems from Laws of the Black Body, um, including some, some language from this. So if you get a chance, go downtown. It's up until, I think, March 6th. Um, and, and it's really kind of exciting to see how she's doing that. And, and I just love the way we work together. And reading that reminded me of it. So this next poem is Particle, Therefore Wave. Pops bailed the basement with box store towels, with pots, with pans. Kid feet creaked upstairs to dump sop and then tromped back down for more again. News. Climate folks warn of these more frequent storms. My debit card's magnet was shot last year. I wanted to replace it, really. The bank lived just, just up the road, but I just couldn't. Things go awry, and mostly I just let them. I worry. I wait for Pops to slip in all that water, but he doesn't. And the kid feet keep the march up, the descent, return his flood to the bloated earth again. Next, I'm going to read Constant, which is uh, the poem that you have in your beautiful broadside. Thank you again, Sarah. And this is a very autumn poem rather than spring, but it's nice to be coming out of that cycle. What else made sense but the push to climb one another, hand over hand and grab at whoever was near enough? The season groaned on into November. Grows bled, branch to sky, Stone upon stone upon stone towered toward a heaven that flushed its three-day-old lie of bruise. Snowflakes threatened war, and the moon split town and swore not to return for days. Your flicker and turn a lighthouse and a storm. At quarter to six, the sun went down forever, so what else made sense? but to climb one another, hand over hand, and cleave to whomever was left, and near enough, and would. So I come from a, a multicultural background. I think of myself as a bit of a hybrid text. <laughs> um, my mother is very much an American city girl. She's from Detroit. And my father is very much a country guy from uh, northern Somalia. 
and they met in college. Um, and, uh, and they're two very, very different people, um, <laughs> to say the least. Um, different cultures, different religions, different, you know, she's like five feet tall, he's six four. They could, they, they could not be more opposite. Um, and, and my father, as you've probably heard already, we, has woven himself through many of these poems. I think um, my mother, as her, as her way, she was an English language arts teacher, and so her voice is always correcting my grammar in my head. Uh, and, and I think her body has, um, and her family, because uh, I grew up with them more since they're from here. Uh, takes up more space in the first two books, and my father came crashing into this one. It's about time. Uh, and so, I don't know, this, this, this poem is really for him. This cookie walked her brown hair across the road. Her bindle stick skillet, thanks Jim, an easeful balance of two dozen eggs her pockets buzzed, her clothes bored to black holes. The radio said, we'd soon leave here. That's not what it said. The radio said, we'd soon leave our rockets here. Sail the starlight winds. Start anew and again. Promises, promises. In America, Eocene candles, camels roamed tiny cute would have made such nice pets. About this big. <laughs> My father and I, still blind from camel spit, the excuse of it, try ways to stop stopping and going, but this cookie passes our stand, and for a minute or two, we're all of us just damp desert nomads. If we'd mate our phone with her phone, she'd crack her eggs and light us a fire. We'd sit, finally sit, stitch sailcloth, and toss our fragile wishbones, missing serious, but nipping his master's bow. A black body curve. And the black body curve is, is um, one of the major laws, Planck, who you'll see his name on that broadside, um, who was really the kind of um, father of quantum physics in a lot of ways, and discovered this uh, black body theory in a way that um, rather disturbed him because he really wanted to be a classical physicist and was not trying to start something new. Um, and, uh, and so I've been thinking about this curve for years and years since it began obsessing me. And, um, and it's never quite made it into a poem until the poem made its way into it. Stairs, a rushed flight down 38, French doors unlocked, always. Always a lie, an argument. Argument, two buck hunters circle a meadow's edge edge, one of us outside bleeding. Bleeding, shards of glass, doors locked. Locked, carpet awash with blood. Blood, lift and drop, a sudden breeze. Breeze, its whistle through bone. Bone, the other was looking at. Bone, cradled to catch drips. Drips, quiet as a meadow fawn. Fawn, faces down each hunter, each gun. Gun, again. Again. Somebody call someone. Someone almost always prefers forgetting. Forgetting an argument, a lie. 
lie. A meadow, a casement, a stair. So I'll close with these two poems. The first is gray body assumptions. So if a black body is perfectly absorptive and a white body is perfectly reflective, you know, I'm rubber, you're glue. The gray body is a bit morphy, let's say. I wasn't warned about these things. The never hush, the maddening chase, chafe, sliding down a reddened bridge, print disappearing and disappearing. Now what? I was never told how to brook the hound's tooth stench of growing old, only that time runs out as it does. And still I sisyphus myself to these damned glasses. Hobble my wreckage down stair after stair in search of a, gra of a gasp of that same bricky air down streets where trees are green as apples, red as apples, gold as apples crunch their peril underfoot. Once I leave home, it's gaseous oven. Once I walk the sl same slow steps as this hide-and-seek sun, once I face my anti-lover's gaze, bright, open, later, now, eyes smoldered, swept open coats flashed, my own scarred belly, my own hot hands ablaze with spent matches and burnt out love, then what? Remember love? How it loosed its jaw to our kisses? How it unhinged us? How it tried us like so many keys, like so many rusted locks? How it missed its target despite all its kicking? And yeah, maybe its force could kill, but without it, what's left to trundle my legs? What's left to push breath, ragged and torn, from my lungs? Maybe I should have known progress, measured in ratchet thumbs, as somebody else's children took off running through this deadened land to fight what solar winds would leave of, uh, leave of us, brown and bruised as apples, overripe host and blousy seed, disappearing and disappearing. I'll end with consumption. And thank you all for being here and for your kind listening. Brother, I don't either understand this skip-scrapple world. These slick bubble cars sip feverish down rushes of not corn, of not beets, of not cabbage and the land and the land. You should know, man, nothing grows down here anymore except walloped wishes and their gouged out oil cans where not bloodroot spans us, sit towers landmined in the sand, they twist us, they tornado us. No. Do spring breezes bring the scent of smelt? Remember? Even on strike, our mother found smelt by the gross fingery bagfuls and fried them whole. I wish I knew how she did it. It was almost enough. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I think we get to have a little conversation if anybody has questions or... Well, how did you come to creative literature, to teaching creative literature and specifically poetry? Oh, circuitously. Um, 
Well, I come from a long line of teachers on my mother's side. My mother was a teacher, my grandmother was a teacher, my grandmother's grandma was, you know, there's a lot of teachers. Uh, my father was a teacher. Um, and I, I've taught since really I was in college um, and in various ways around it. Um, and poetry is something that I've always loved. Um, often despite myself, you know? <laughs> um, and I think, again, with this, this new project, it's interesting, I um, kind of entered this through my father. I, I, I mentioned that my mother was a, an elementary school language arts teacher, and my father was a math and physics guy. That's how he got into this country. That's why I'm born. And, um, and he wound up teaching uh, because he uh, chose marrying my mom rather than going home. And, uh, and so I sta stayed in Michigan and uh, became a math teacher. And let's just say I got my mom's head. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we always kind of clashed on um, how to live life in a way. Uh, and spending more time with him as, as he's gotten older too, I, I really understood his mind in a different way. And um, sitting in his basement where he loves to Michigan football. Um, <laughs> go blue um, I say for him he always is like are you watching the game I'm like that I'm never watching the game every time you ask me that I'm absolutely never watching the game but uh, <laughs> uh, but really kind of going through all of his books and kind of fell in love with physics which was always the science that intrigued me um, and and I think that's how this kind of book became his is is we kind of met. Being back home, he also kind of got to see what I do, and and we spent more time with each other and, and understood each other. So, yeah. Yes? And what is Planck's constant? <laughs> what is Planck's constant? Well, it's interesting, because I know I answer that question with the poem. Uh, you know, that's one of the things, you know, like, I've read so many theoretical physics books, <laughs> and they remind me why I don't do theoretical physics. Um, <laughs> and I understand them in a way that gets me to the poems, and I read them again and again and again. I actually have a wonderful physicist, physicist friend here. I had one at Michigan, too, who I sit and have these conversations with, and... Um, my physicist friend here, who's a theoretical physicist, um, also loves poetry. Boone, again, thanks, Reed. Um, and if I were to like explain it um, as the textbook would, like I, I, I would fall asleep. I don't, I don't think that way. Um, I can sit down and read it again and be like, oh yeah, I totally get that. But I know I get it in the poem, and that's kind of how I speak. It's how I think, and that's how I will always answer those questions because. That's my language. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say that I'm really, I, I, I was just really romanced by your poetry. Thank and, you. And the reason why is because, you know, I could hear Gwendolyn Brooks, mm -hmm. Audrey mm -hmm. Lord, I could mm -hmm. hear Nikki Giovanni, mm -hmm. but it wasn't wrapped in so much blackness. And, and, and the meter that you use mm -hmm. was not a meter that was contrived by um, by foot. You use your case around your enjambments mm -hmm. to create that meter. And I, I could just hear that style, but it was wrapped in blackness. I think you know where I'm coming from. And I, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed being taken mm -hmm. away from that in another context. Mm -hmm. And it was really, uh, it was really sweet to hear. Thank you, thank you. I definitely, it feels very wrapped in blackness to me. Um, but I, I think um, the meter, especially in these poems, I, it's def, it's more jazz than march. Um, and yeah. I read Planck's constant as a very uh, apocalyptic and political poem. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't know if you meant it or not, 
But what about the business about four people are like crabs in a bucket climbing mm -hmm. on each other? Were you using that, or am I just reading that in? Well, I mean, I think that's absolutely a part of the conceit, and yet I f I'm interested in flipping that, right? At the, I think, you know, if we, even if we go back to your comment, there's this way that we conceive of particularly like even desperate communities kind of dragging each other down when I think actually if, if we kind of close our eyes and think about how we might conceive of this, and that's the and would at the end, is I, I think we must reach for each other. Um, but I don't think it's a dragging, I think it's a, an enveloping, and I think it's a, a kind of collective rising, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Have you found your writing or your thinking or interests uh, changing substantively since you've been in Portland? Well, I'll say this for certain. One thing that has absolutely found its way into my poetry and into my thinking is the sky here. The morning sky especially, the winter morning sky especially, has just it's just taken me and it's sneaking into all of my work and it's made this committed night person into a freaky morning person <laughs> and <laughs> I, I was I woke up this morning and and I was so sleepy and then I was like wait you're missing the light the sky you know like I have to go out I have to see it it's so beautiful uh, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I was a little terrified of the rain when I moved here, and then I, I fell in love with it so quickly, I surprised myself. Um, I still surprised, I'm like, come on, rain, it was really sunny for a few days there, and I was like, this is beautiful. And then after a few days, I'm like, but when's the rain coming back? <laughs> if you had told me that that would have been my thought, I would have been like, no, I love the sun. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's a really kind of, what seeps in is, is a sense of this kind of natural beauty and the light, especially, which which enchants me. Yes. Is there one particular writer, poet, uh, who comes to mind when you think just off the top of your head? And the second part is: Is there a moment? Have you met them, her or him? And is there a moment that? you remember most about me. Oh. Well, all right. Well, I have, I have, I have a few different answers, right? There's the go-to, um, which for me, as a kind of burgeoning poet, was June Jordan. That's why I went to UC Berkeley, was to apprentice myself to her, really. Um, I fell in love with poetry at, at a really early age. My mother used to read it to us all the time. And, and then I fell in love with writing it, you know, as a teenager, and uh, and I was going to another college, you know, and I fell in love with June Jordan, and she was there, and I was like, well, now I have to go to Berkeley, I have to leave, I have to go, and that's why I went there, and that's the going to, and there's also going away, right? I share a birthday with Sylvia Plath. <laughs> you may have heard a little of that in Graham, and so there's and there's this constant resistance for me, um, not to her or her work necessarily, but to um, a, a similarity that I think um, people like to kind of place over me and a bit like a bit of a cloak and I kind of dodge. <laughs> so there's the go-to in a way, I think. Is that resisting being a victim or is it resisting being confessional or what is it you're trying to... You're, what I'm resisting you're being not Samia. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Any others? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.